Good morning, church. All right, so we're going to be reading from Jonah chapter 1, verse 4 through 5. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. Once again, that's Jonah chapter 1, 4 to 5. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. Thanks, Luke. Appreciate it. Bless you. Would you join me in order to pray? Jesus, how we thank you that you've given us your word to come to, how your word shapes and molds us. Lord, would you um, give us your confidence through the Holy Spirit to hear what you would have to say uh, to each of us today, Lord. Would you encourage and challenge our hearts? Lord, would you speak through me words that are right and true and of you? Um, And Lord, we do, again, just pray for our VBS, Lord, that these children would truly see you this week and that you would let us be faithful uh, to fulfill your call here in Kailua by sharing your gospel. Lord, would you be with those who aren't with us today, maybe joining with us online, or maybe at home sick, or just away from us, would you encourage them, bless them, challenge them uh, where needed. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I don't know what it is about youth camps, but everyone that I've been a part of, or led, or heard about, always has this moment of the bonfire Saturday night. If any of you have been to youth camp, you know what this bonfire is. It's like the secret weapon of all youth pastors. Like God instructed us to do this, the last night of youth camp. And it was 2018, uh, KCC's youth camp in the fall. We were out at Kualoa Beach Park, and we were playing the song of all bonfire songs, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. You know, everybody's heart's just primed and ripe for the Lord to do something. And us as leaders have been talking all weekend about what to do during response time. We're like, God, would you give us this really clever idea that's never been done, that these kids can respond to you during the bonfire. So we were sitting there scratching our heads trying to figure it out, and we saw a stick, and we're like, oh, that'd be cool. What if we get a bunch of sticks ready, and we invite the kids that if there's some secret area of sin in their life or an area they don't trust the Lord, that during the response time, they can go pick up a stick, and they can throw it into the bonfire as a way of giving that to the Lord. Well, at this youth camp, we had a new girl show up. Literally, she showed up at camp with her friends, not even with her parents, and they were like, hey, can, can she stay for youth camp, Pastor Pete? And that one question, this little girl smiling at me and no parents around. And it's like, okay, I got to think through all the legalities of this. And I'm like, yeah, definitely. I'm a youth pastor. Of course, the answer is yes. And so this new girl shows up at her youth group for this youth camp. And we don't think that she's saved. She's never given her life to Jesus. And, and it's our desire. We're like, oh, man, we just want her to get saved this weekend. So all of us leaders are praying for this girl. Lord, would you let her get saved? And we think of the stick idea. We're like, Lord, would you let her during the response time, would you let her go and pick up a stick? And, and that stick representing her entire life and throwing that into the fire, signifying that she wants to give her life to Jesus. God, wouldn't that be so cool if she does that during response time? So we're praying for that. And then, you know, Holy Spirit just gets done. And I, I give the invitation. I'm like, okay, students, if there's anything in your life you need to give to Jesus, maybe a sin, Maybe it's your life, and I'm like looking at her and sending her Holy Spirit vibes. That's really bad theology, but like trying to get her to do something. And last weekend, at the end of our time together, Pastor Josh also invited all of us into that same bonfire moment where we reflected on Psalm 139, and we were just like, God, is there any, any area of my life that I need to give over to you, an area of sin, an area of of lack of trust. And that was such a beautiful place where where Pastor Josh led us. I just want us to go back to that moment. Um, And we're going to, this morning, just kind of springboard off of that moment that we ended our time with last night. So if you have your sermon outlines, there's a few more at that door, I know, or PDF online, if you've got a pen, if you've got your phone, 
Um, I'm just going to invite you. I'm, I'll read the psalm. I'm just going to invite you just to have a quiet moment for the Lord. Just let him search your heart and see if there's, there's anything you need to, to bring to him, a secret sin or something. And if something comes to mind, let's say he convicts you of, of greed. You know, if you write down greed, that might be kind of awkward if somebody looks. So maybe just choose a letter from the word, like the letter E or something. Just some way that you can just know, like, okay, this is an area of sin that the Lord is highlighting. He wants me to bring it to him or an area of lack of trust or something. The Lord wants me to, to give to him more. So I'll just read these, these words. Go ahead and just close your mind or close your eyes uh, and just ask the Lord to, to search you. So here's, here's the words of Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Put me to the test and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there is any hurtful way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Maybe you were lazy with your chores. You raised your voice at your kids. Let your mind dwell on that mistake that your friend made. Whatever it is, just let, let the Lord speak to you. And then if, if there is an area that the Lord highlighted to you, something to give to him, just jot down one letter of that or at least think about it. Um, put that into your mind. Um, and, and we'll keep moving. So if you didn't think of something, I do want to encourage you with a verse. It's 1 John 1, 1.8. It's a verse that says this. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So good news for you. All of us in this room have sinned. I've sinned, you've sinned, we've all sinned. And we're just going to be real about it. We're a real church. Nobody has to pretend like you got it all together because we don't. None of us do. But we can be honest that we've all blown it a time or two. And if you're anything like me, you've probably already blown it today. So usually at night, we have a six-month-old baby, Nakoa. Um, I, last night, I was, I was a good boy. But usually in the middle of the night, when I go to bed, I'm sleeping, I'm sound asleep. But then I hear baby Nakoa like, start crying. He needs some attention. And I have this choice to make at 3 a.m. Do I get up and help baby Nakoa? Or do I just roll over, pretend like I didn't hear, and let my lovely wife Liz take care of baby Nakoa? That's usually what I do. I have the sin of selfishness and entitlement. I deserve a good night of sleep. I'm a vile sinner at 3 a.m. And I'm the preacher. But that's our first truth today, is that you've blown it. You've blown it. And so have I. So you can write that in your sermon outline, you've blown it. And our sermon title is, Have You Blown It? It's an easy answer for all of us. The answer is, yes, you have. And you're in good company, because we all have too. So we just started discovering God's message in the book of Jonah. Uh, Pastor Josh laid the, the foundations that it's a prophetic book, but it's not a book about the words of God through a prophet. It's a historical narrative about a prophet. And the book's full of satire, it's full of irony, and in the story we see that God is omnipresent. Wherever you go, whether if it's on a, a ship or in the belly of a fish, God is there with you. And he's omnipotent, he has the power over the wind and the sea and the whole earth. And God has a mission to rescue the villains, all those guys, those Ninevites over there. And he has a plan to use you, all the good guys, to do it. And that is is God's mission. And here God calls Jonah to go to the city full of villains, the Ninevites, and to share the gospel with them. But there's a little hiccup because Jonah does something wrong. A couple days ago, Liz, my wife, was, was reading the news and she discovered that the sunscreen we bought to protect our kids from cancer um, actually got recalled because it has a chemical in it that causes cancer. It's like, are you kidding me? We, we did everything right. We spent the 15 bucks to buy the cool little bottles. We went through the pain and agony of spraying our kids and it goes in their eyes and they're like, ah, oh, dad, why'd you do that? And we did everything right. This company did something wrong. And that wasn't fair that what they did wrong hurt us. And we live in a culture that would agree with that because our morality of our culture is called 
the harm principle of morality, that if what you do harms another, then it's not moral, it is wrong. But that same harm principle of morality would say that if you do something in private, it's a private mistake, and if it doesn't hurt anybody, then it's okay. Then it's a moral thing to do. And so we have Jonah here doing a, a private sin. You know the story. It's just between him and God. God says, go to Nineveh. He says, no, I'm just going to go that way. Just something internal. But Jonah's still a good guy. He still goes and, and he brings money and he pays the fare to get on a boat. He's not dealing drugs. He's not being rude to the sailors. He's still an honest man. It's just a private sin that he's doing, running away from God. There's no public consequences here, right? Well, you know the story. If you heard what Luke read, we know it, it goes differently. Jonah 1, verses 4 through 5 will be on the screen. It says, The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on that sea, so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God. And they threw the cargo, which was in the ship, into the sea to lighten it for them. Now, I've never traveled 2,500 miles by boat, sailboat at that, but I can imagine that if you were going to do that, it probably had to be a pretty profitable voyage. I heard from somebody after the last service, they were probably going to Tarshish to collect tin. It was a, a very valuable, rare metal that if you got tin, then you could make bronze. And in that age, if you had bronze, you would be the victor of any war. And so they were going probably to make a buck. And their cargo was probably how they were going to be able to afford that expensive tin or whatever it was. That cargo was precious to them on the ship. And here you have them hurling all their, their goods overboard. It could have been their gold, their silver, their, their sacred scrolls, their perfumes, their spices, their animals overboard. Just tons of wealth being lost. Not to mention their boat's breaking up, maybe their mast is breaking. And at the very least, their provisions are gone. And they're going to have to go back to Joppa, restart their trip, lose a few months' time, rebuy the supplies. All of this loss of money and time, possibly the loss of life, because Jonah had a private sin between him and God. Which brings us to our second truth of our passage today. Your private sin has public consequences. Your private sin has public consequences. And while the sailors were busy throwing tens of thousands of dollars of cargo overboard, you know what Jonah was doing? If you know it, you call it out. He was sleeping. Check out the end of the verse. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laid down, and fallen sound asleep. I used to work on the ambulances out here. It was one of my first jobs when I moved to the island. And the first year was kind of a rough year. They would assign me to a different station every day. One day I'd be in Waikai, one day I'd be in Waianae, one day it would be in the morning, one day it would be at night. And I was on my toes driving to new places all over. After a year of this, I don't know how I lucked out, but I got assigned a day shift. Three months solid of 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. I was living the dream, and it was one station. It was up in Wahiwa, H3, 30-minute drive. I hop in my 2003 Saturn, and I squeezed in there, and it was great. After a few weeks of doing that same commute over and over, and those of you that commute the same commute frequently, you know what you can do. It's just like you hop in your car, and you push the autopilot button, and then 30 minutes later, you show up at your job, and you're like, wait a second, I don't even remember what happened the last 30 minutes. I know I was driving 60 miles an hour next to other people who were driving 60 miles an hour. Did it rain on me when I was in the mountains? Did I cut somebody off? Was I speeding? I just zoned all that out, 30 minutes of time. It's a little bit scary. But what happens when you and I do the same thing over and over and over? It's like we go on autopilot and we start zoning out of life and we don't perceive the things around us. And I see that's what's going on with Jonah here, he's a prophet of God. He's supposed to be able to hear from God in ways that other people can't. But he's the only one not hearing from God when God is hollering at him through this storm. Hebrews 3.13 tells us that our hearts get hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And I think that Jonah in this moment, his heart has become so 
hard that he's just zoning out of life and doesn't see the calamity that he's bringing on himself and those around him. And so the captain of a ship, a pagan man, has to come down into the ship, wake up the sleeping prophet, and rebuke him. And verse 6, the next verse in our story says, How is it that you are still sleeping? The captain says. Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. How ironic that the pagan is preaching to the prophet to pray. It's supposed to be the other way around. But Jonah, the mighty Jonah, the prophet of God of Israel, has fallen. And now he's being rebuked by a pagan sailor. You can go into your Bibles. I've just been reading the story, but you can go in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs. We're going to slow down. We're going to look at this verse for a second. Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. Proverbs 28, 13. Just the first part says this. He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper. And Jonah is not prospering right now, and he's bringing others down with him. He is a horrible example of a follower of God. And we got him right here in scriptures. But before you go and you rail on Jonah too hard, you remember John 17, 17. And one of the purposes of scripture is to make you more like Christ. Then you think of Matthew 28, the Great Commission, and how God has called you to go share the gospel with your Ninevites, with your neighbors, with your coworkers, with your friends, with, with your kids. And then maybe you look down at that piece of paper from our campfire moment this morning and you think about that sin and I ask you the question, are you trying to be too quiet with that sin to avoid being seen by God? Are you, are you running down that hallway, running away to Tarshish, trying to escape from God's storm? Are you are you on autopilot in that sin over and over in your life that it's just like you're zoning out and you don't even see the calamity of storms that God has brought to you to get your attention? And this is where the book of Jonah gets tough because you only have a few characters in the story. And when we read a story, we usually identify with one of the characters. Hey, that character reminds me of me. And the first few times I read this, probably the first hundred times I read this, I was identifying with the sailors. It's easy for me to identify with being the one who bears the consequences of somebody else's sin. But if you were honest with yourself, with that campfire moment, the start of this sermon, perhaps you see that too often you identify with Jonah. And so do I. So having seen that you've blown it, and that your private sin causes public consequences, what are you going to do with your sin? What are you going to do with your sin? I don't know if you guys noticed last week, but I showed up to church with a pretty fresh haircut. I was looking pretty good last week. And if, if you're an observant individual and maybe you talked with me, you came up and you said, hey, nice haircut, Pastor Pete, to which I gave you a really weird reply. And I said, thank you. I was the active participant. To which you would have like paused and thought like, that's weird. And then thought about it and you're like, wait, did you cut your own hair? And I said, it's me. I'm my own barber. I've been doing it since my parents stopped cutting my hair when I was 18. I only didn't cut my hair one time. I gave that opportunity to my wife before she was my wife and she has never been allowed to try again. But you, did, you, you tried your best, babe. But the secret to me learning how to be a great barber started long before I was 18. I was five years old. Little people, daycare. God bless them. It must have been Valentine's Day or something. They gave us these little scissors to cut out hearts for our mom. I don't know. Arts and Crafts Day. And clever little Pete knew I had to be preparing for my financial success in the future. And so I, I look at those scissors and I'm like, I know what I can do. Start cutting my hair straight down the middle. Man, I knew that I was looking good and fresh that day. I don't know what happened at, at preschool, if, if I got consequences or anything, but I know what happened after preschool. When my dad showed up that day, of all the days for my dad to show up, he comes in his truck and he picks up little Pete from, from preschool. I hop in the truck and he looks at me and he's like, what happened to your hair? Uh, nothing, dad. N nothing happened to my hair today. Just normal day at preschool, you know, preschool things. 
no, Pete, you have a bald spot right there. And I'm like, I don't see it, Dad. No bald spot here. Sorry, Dad, this is confession time. Um, He eventually got it out of me. I did, in fact, cut my hair. That was me. But I didn't want to get in trouble. And so I thought of the best excuse ever. The justification of all justifications. I'm sure I pinky promised to you, Dad. So I was like, Dad, if you had been in my shoes, you would have done the same thing, I'm sure, because the ceiling, it was the weirdest thing. It like grew a mouth and it started talking and it told me to cut my hair. It was the ceiling's fault, Dad. It was the most ridiculous excuse ever, but I was sure it would work. But as ridiculous as that excuse is, how often do you and I do that same thing with God? Where we say, yeah, yeah, God, sure, I yelled at my kids, but they were driving me bonkers. Or, or maybe you can't afford to tithe right now because you've got to pay off your car payment first. Or you went to that website, but you don't watch that stuff as often as your buddy does. Or you have to live with your girlfriend because it's financially irresponsible not to live with her. Or you have to finish that bottle because you deserve it after a long, hard, stressful day. Or you can't commit to coming to church every week because you have a game on Sunday mornings. And it's like you're sitting in the passenger seat and God is looking at you, driving you home from preschool, and he sees this bald spot. And he's just tired of these excuses. He can see right through them, just like my dad could see through my excuse. And what if we just started calling our sin, sin, and owning up to it, and being done with those excuses? Which brings us to our third truth today. Own up to your sin. Own up to it. Just call it for what it is. I read you the first part of Proverbs 28, 13. Um, it says, He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper. Let's, let's read the last part of that verse now. It says this. He says, But he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. The definition of compassion is sympathetic pity and concern for the suffering of others. And when you confess and forsake your sins, you not only get God's concern for you in your suffering, but God himself has joined with you in that suffering by coming to this earth, living a hard life and dying a gruesome death to show you that he has joined with you in the storms of life. That he wants to give you his compassion when you confess and forsake your sins. But maybe you've done the first part of that verse. You can keep that verse up. Maybe you've confessed your sin, the, the sin of the same sin over and over, the sin of impatience, the sin of rudeness, the sin of gluttony, the, same, the sin of greed, the sin of lust over and over again. You're like, God, I'm sorry that I did that sin. A couple days later, God, I'm sorry I did that sin again. A couple days later, God, I'm sorry I did that sin. Ten years later, God, I'm sorry I did that same sin again. And you're confessing that sin and you want to gain freedom. You want to gain God's compassion but that second part of the verse says forsakes also and you haven't found a way to forsake that sin and and gain freedom from it i just want to encourage you with maybe a, a couple new ideas of how to forsake a sin because the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and hoping for a new result so if you want a new result for your sin if you confess your sin and and you have yet to find freedom try something else to forsake your sin, find God's compassion. Something that I have found really helpful in gaining freedom and forsaking my sin is confession. So we're, we're commanded in Scripture to confess our sins privately, and God forgives us, and that's a great thing. But also in Scripture, we're commanded, and we see in church history, that Christians throughout the centuries have confessed their sins to one another, like actually confessing to another human. My cousin is, an, is a pastor on the side, and he and I go on a beach walk once or twice a month, and, and he's just so, a safe person I can share my struggles with, my, my temptations, my sins. And he can just tell me God's truth of forgiveness over me and God's compassion over me. If, if private confession isn't working, maybe try confessing with another. But 
don't just do it with anybody. You could, you know, find yourself in a real hard spot. Make sure you find a, a trusted spiritual leader to confess with, maybe somebody who's the same gender, somebody who would speak God's forgiveness over you, somebody you can trust to hold that well. Another way that has been tremendously helpful for me is a few months ago I started wearing this bracelet. It has a, a cross bead in the middle of it. And any time I want to sin, I'm like, ooh, sinning sounds fun right now. I just look at this cross. And then it's like, after you look at a cross, man, what kind of hypocrite would I be to go and sin? Like, this is just a good reminder for me to forsake my sin and to walk in freedom. Other ways could be you talk to myself, Pastor Josh, an elder, a spiritual leader in your life. Maybe get this book on Amazon, The Steps to Freedom in Christ. It's like a 10-page workbook about how to gain freedom and forsake your sin. It's six bucks on Amazon. Join a, a Bible study. Join an accountability group. Do a fast. Go on a, a walk in the, in the mountains and just have some silence with God and alone time with God. But do something with your sin. If you've owned it and confessed it and it's not working to forsake it, do something else. Try something else to forsake your sin and find God's compassion. Which brings us to our final truth of today. Own up to your sin and let God's grace come in. Own up to your sin and let God's grace come in. God wants to give you his grace. He wants to give you his compassion. He's joined with you in the storms and suffering of life and in your sin to give you that grace. Frank was born on July 14th in 1952. He lived out in the Appalachians uh, in a log cabin with his family. He loved hunting, fishing. As he got older, he found those things boring. He wanted a little more excitement in life. And so he started drinking, started smoking, started living the fast life, as he calls it. And he, so much so, he got expelled from school and had the great idea to run, run away. And he went to Europe, drinking his heart out all around Europe in the 70s. Well, his dad caught up to him in Europe, and, and he confronted his son. He said to his son, he said, Frank... I want you to know that your mother and I sense there is a struggle for the soul of your life, and you're going to have to make a choice. And then Frank, or if you prefer his full name, Franklin Graham, did make a choice. In response to his dad, Billy, Billy Graham, talking with him, and he made a choice to own up to his sin and let God's grace come in. And because of that private decision to let God's grace come in, there's been publicly 178 million kids who have received shoeboxes through Franklin Graham's ministry, Operation Christmas Child. 1 John 1, 9 says, If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You see, the book of Jonah isn't just about a man being swallowed by a fish. The book of Jonah is about God who so fiercely loves you that he's willing to send storms into your life to wake you up from the dangers and the perils that you're in. And God who has joined with you in that very storm to show you compassion so that you will own up to your sin and let God's grace come in. Would you pray with me? If you're here and you have never owned up to your sins, if you've never let God's grace come in, but you know you need to, you know that there's that stick that you need to throw into the fire, would you pray something like this in your heart? Would you say, Jesus, I'm sorry for the ways I've blown it. I own up to it now, Lord, and I ask that your grace would come in. And I ask that you would forgive me. I believe you died on the cross, that you rose again. Would you give me new life through your spirit? If you're here and if, if you've already prayed that before and Maybe there is a stick that you need to throw into that fire, sin you need to give to the Lord. Would you just confess that to the Lord? Say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for what I've done. God, I, I not only want to confess, but I want to forsake my sin. I want to gain freedom. I want to walk with you. I want to live on mission with you. Would you give me your compassion? And would you help me walk in your freedom by your Spirit? It's in Jesus' name, amen. May you give heed to the blameless way and set no worthless thing before your eyes so that you will walk within your house in the integrity of your heart. Amen. Thanks so much, church, for praying for VBS, helping us out, and we'll see you soon.